For six weeks every spring, the center of the design world is New York City. My name is Daniela Ohad and I'm in New York speaking to architects, designers, and writers who dominate this season. What another difference between good design, great design, and the very best? Best design opens new horizons, but more important, it enhances our relationships with other people and with ourselves. I'm here with architect Gil Evansour to discuss his new office building in Brooklyn's Boer Park. It is a great example of how contemporary and modernist building can be fully integrated in its urban fabric. Gil, you create buildings that come to empower their communities. How will this building engage the site? Uh, the site is very, very interesting and int introduces um, a, a real unique uh, situation in Brooklyn where um, where Church Avenue and 14 uh, Avenue <coughs> connects and create this uh, wonderful triangular open space right in, uh, uh, right in front of our, our site. Uh, you know, the history of these two neighborhoods are, is very rich, like all the neighborhoods in New York. There's a lot of uh, changes, uh, different communities, uh, and diversity kind of along the years adapted uh, uh, existing buildings, existing structure, you know, synagogues became churches and vice versa. Um, so in, in our building, in our architecture, uh, we try to create a building that is receptive to these changes, to this diversity, you know, request of the program of this, of the, of the developer, of our client, is to create a building that could be able to change over time. Your exploration with both nostalgia and history have come to shape your architecture. Sure. How do you use these elements this in is, your building, in your thinking? This is who I am, you know, I'm, um, I'm interested in the past. I, I love Tell dealing, me about your past. I love dealing with my past. You know, I keep on coming back to my childhood, to my memories, to, um, you know, the way I used, as a child, I used to look at light and the water in Israel where I grew up by the beach. I used to always look at uh, stones and the way light admits through the stone. My parents at some point were worried about me, about this dreamy boy that was looking at the light all the time. But, but this, is, this is who I am. I keep on looking back. And also, you know, my time as a professor of teaching students, I keep on asking them to develop this awareness of space, awareness of place. Because for an architect, is, for architecture in general, is so important because architecture more than any other arts uh, communicate and transcends history. A and, and, and that's, that's, that's part of my personality and, and that's the way I love to you know, engage with architecture. You are modernist and modernism was founded upon the idea of internationalism, but it has become crucial to bring a sense of local identity. How do you negotiate between the two? You, you know, um, I, I think, you know, there are buildings that architects love and there are buildings that people love. You know, I try to create buildings that people love. And I, I think there's a gap between what, you know, architects learn to love, grew up on the, you know, on these ideas of modernism. But I, I keep looking back even more, you know, architecture has an enormous, you know, we are so fortunate to have, to work in a discipline that has this enormous amount of history documented. It's there, you can just go and see. You know, if you think of architecture as a reflection of our society, which it is, I think now there are waves of social change in the world where people are going back to their own selves to their own communities to try and find, you know, the light and the way they use, specifically use buildings. So my goal as an architect is to create a building that can stand this test of time. This can be able to accommodate and be loved by people, not only now, not in the magazines, but also, you know, also in 20 years, in 30 years, in 50 years, in 100 years, you know, who knows. New York 
York architects Todd Williams and Billy Chen received harsh criticism for their design of the Obama Presidential Center. The best analysis was published in Curd by one of the boldest voices in architecture criticism, Alexander Lang. Alexandra, thanks for being here. Um, can you tell me um, your opposition on two aspects of the program, the architecture and the location? The first and possibly the most important um, criticism I had of the Obama Center is that it's located in Jackson Park, which is a park designed by Frederick Law Olmsted for the 1893 World's Fair. Um, and it wasn't clear to me why a presidential center should be in a park, should be taking public park land at a time when um, open space in cities is at such a premium. Talking about location, you suggest that the Obama Foundation Center undermines Southside communities in a way that the Obama candidate would never have tolerated. And I wonder whether this project can hurt his legacy. It is possible. It's fascinating because in some of the you know, run up to announcing the center plans, Obama has really emphasized his South Side bona fides, that that's where he started his career, that's where he met Michelle Obama, and on and on. And yet um, there are a number of community groups, you know, present day community organizers that have raised some important issues about the center, mostly having to do with gentrification, um, the raise in rent prices that's already happened in the neighborhood and feeling like the library and cent the center may be more aimed at people from outside the South Side than people inside the South Side. The Obama Foundation announced that the preference for modernist design rather than neoclassical design, but when President Obama first commented on the design, he said it was too quiet. If you're familiar with the work of Todd Williams and Billy Chen, I mean, it's always quiet. They're not flamboyant architects. And what the beauty of their work is really in the materials and the details. And you have to be up close to those things to, to really see it. Um, but one of the most striking elements in the current plan, which has three buildings, is this tall museum tower, which is 235 feet. And reading between the lines, it seems like the museum tower was probably designed to overcome this objection on Obama's part, um, that you know, if, if you have a tower, it can't be too quiet. But the tower really, from my perspective, sticks out like a store thumb. I mean, the other buildings in the park, there's a neoclassical museum building. They're all low. Um, they're very related to the, um, the landscape and the ground plane. And this tower is going to be one of the tallest things around. And it doesn't have a lot of program in it. It has a few floors of museum, and then it has a roof deck up on top. And I just question the need for such a tall building. On May 7th, the Obama Foundation announced some changes to the plans, and I wonder whether these changes address any of your opposition. The two, the two changes they made, one was to the, um, the position of a playground that's part of the part of the Obama Center to move it closer to what will be a branch of the public library. The second change was to flatten out the plaza that connects the three buildings that are part of the center. Um, and I think both of these changes were really made for pragmatic reasons, to address some of the community concerns. Um, parents visiting the public library wouldn't want to have to walk a long distance in the park to also use a playground. And the plaza, um, I think the sense is that it would be more welcoming if it didn't have um, a, a sunken fountain in the center, that it would be easier to program for events. So I think both of those are probably wise decisions from a pragmatic point of view, but I don't think they address the overall concern. So there's still a lot of issues, and these seem like relatively small changes made to show that they're listening to the community, but not really addressing the big picture issues. So are you going to keep informing us about, the, um, about this process? Yeah, I'm watching the process really carefully. The center still has to overcome another, a number of other hurdles in order to get approvals. And where can we read it? Um, on Curbed. Always on Curbed. Yes. Okay.
Anthony Robbins is the vice president of the Art Deco Society of New York. He leads walking tours and teaches at Columbia and NYU. His latest book has just won the New York City Book Award. It is New York Art Deco, a guide to Gotham's jazz age architecture. Anthony, New York's Art Deco skyscrapers can be considered as the most visible and important contribution of America to the history of architectures in the 20s and 30s. While it was really based on European artistic development, it really came to be totally original. What, how do you describe the innovation of Art Deco architecture in New York? The um, Art Deco as it evolved in this city evolved in skyscrapers. There were no skyscrapers in France or Germany in the 1920s or 30s. The Art Deco there was limited to small buildings because that's what was being built. There is a certain glamour and allure mm -hmm. for New Yorkers to be living and working in Art Deco skyscrapers. Mm -hmm. Still, mm -hmm. what is it about the Art Deco skyscrapers that has still captured the imagination and love of so many New Yorkers? The deco buildings speak to us. They're colorful, they're geometric, they're interesting, they're dramatic. And inside. And inside is the same. The lobbies of those buildings. High are... ceilings, mm. beautiful lobbies. Absolutely. Glamour, grand. And so a lot of the art deco skyscrapers are being converted even as we speak into residential apartment buildings because people want to live, because they are so attractive. Your book provides 15 different itineraries for walking tours in New York. And I, my favorite avenue is Central Park West. I really think this is New York's best avenue architecturally. How would you recommend a tour for me? I would start at 62nd Street and walk straight up to 92nd Street. That's a mile and a half of remarkable buildings. Most of them are not Art Deco. They're earlier. Uh, Art Deco came towards the end of its development, but there's so much color in them. But Central Park West is the residential skyline. If you stand in Central Park and look, you see the towers rising over the trees, and that's part of why it is such a remarkable avenue. And what's your favorite building on Central Park West? Oh, that's an impossible question. There are too it many. Uh, they're all, well, I like 50, um, 55 Central Park West. It's on 66th Street. It's the building that was featured in the movie The Ghostbusters, if anyone remembers that movie. Uh, and the color starts out darker at the bottom in several different shades and then gradually gets lighter as it rises. It's sort of like the vertical windows. It, it, it brings our eye up. Uh, and it's just remarkable to watch. And it's a small building compared to the century, but it's very interesting. Could you comment on destroyed Art Deco skyscrapers? We've actually been very lucky. First of all, it's very rare to tear down a skyscraper. It's just too difficult. It has happened. Um, there was, in the mid-70s, when New York was going through its enormous fiscal crisis, the uh, Chrysler Building was 60% vacant, and there was talk of tearing it down. It's impossible to imagine today. So we've lost some things, but most of it survives, which is why it's so it's such a big part of New York's look. Yes, it definitely is. And I want to tell you, your book is going to serve as my Bible. It is, really. I'm going to put it in my bag, walking in New York, and this is how I'm going to be able to identify all these beautiful buildings. And thanks for being here with us. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure. When the new owners of Philip Johnson's AT&T building announced the remodeling of its legendary lobby, controversy followed. My guest Liz Waitkoff is the executive director of Docomomo US, an international nonprofit organization that comes to preserve landmark architecture. Liz, the AT&T was never a beloved building. Why is it important? Well, that's a great question. Um, the AT&T is an important building primarily because it was one of the first postmodern buildings and one of two of the most important postmodern buildings. Philip Johnson announced the design for the AT&T building as early as 1977. In 1978, he was on the cover of Time magazine cradling a model of the AT&T building. And then just a few months later, he was awarded the very first Pritzker Prize for architecture. So one could argue 
that the first Pritzker Prize was given for the design of the AT&T building. Docomomo is devoted to preservation of architecture of the modern movement, but the AT&T is not a part of this agenda. How did you get involved? Well, the discussions for postmodern architecture have been ongoing with Docomomo for many years. Um, there are some still within Docomomo that are for or against postmodernism. But what we like to say is we're looking at modernism holistically and asking very provocative questions such as, are we still in the modern movement? Are we still part of modernism? Is the modernism in postmodernism just as important as post? So for us, it's less about style. It's more about the importance of the design as it relates to earlier time periods. And then for AT&T specifically, it's a Philip Johnson design. I don't think anyone would consider Philip Johnson just a postmodernist. And at one point, I believe in the mid-50s, he started to move away from modernism, but... He was a modernist. And even by the end of his career, if you um, travel up to the glass house, you can walk around the gardens and actually see his design process. In postmodernism, you're talking a lot about postmodernism, and it was an architecture or a style, I would say, of personality, of drama, but it was never futuristic. Why so many people dislike postmodernism? <laughs> Postmodernism is suffering what all styles or periods of design, whether it be architecture or art, that it takes a certain amount of time for you to stand back, view it better, um, and get an understanding of the context to be so it's really because, be able to appreciate it. Because the, you mean because the taste of the moment is different. Correct. That's what you say. Correct. Okay. I want to ask you about another building, about the old Penn Station. It has become a symbol of the need for architectural preservation. And it was demolished in the 60s. What can we learn from that event that we can apply to the AT&T building? Well, as soon as the, um, the concerns for the demolition of the lower portion of the AT&T building were known, we actually took our cues from the Save Penn Penn Station um, efforts by holding an old school rally with our with our billboards in our hands and we marched in front and protested the demolition or the the changes that were being proposed at the building. So what can we learn from Penn Station is that architecture continues to be threatened. That of all of the art forms, it is the most uh, manipulated and destroyed of all art forms. More than, more than art, fine art, sculpture, architecture continues to see the wrecking ball. People want to um, add to a design of even such incredible important designs of architects such as Philip Johnson. Um, so for preservation community, Penn Station will just continue in perpetuity to be that shining star that leads us on our way of important designs should be conserved and saved. Critics are praising the American Copper Buildings as an example of New York City's best architecture. Greg Pasquarelli is a partner of Shop Architects, responsible for creating these amazing buildings. Greg, thanks for being with us. The American Copper Buildings manifest amazing technological performance, but also they are like an art performance in their own right. What is foremost to you, technology concept? That's a great question. I think that one of the amazing things about being an architect is that you can think of both simultaneously. And so what we find is that the beauty of the buildings and really thinking about the concept and the aesthetics uh, is, is um, really supported by understanding the technology that goes behind building the buildings. And I think when you think about technology and the way that you can use materials in a new way and use uh, the latest 
the latest computer abilities, not only to draw, but to actually manufacture the parts, you suddenly have a new palette of materials and an ability to make sculpture out of a million square foot, 48 story tower. And so it's really both of those things, technology and aesthetics uh, and concept that come together. Is this how you define sharp architects? Very much so. I think that we have always really tried to balance being both thinkers and makers in architecture. We love concept, we love to teach, we love theory, we love art. And at the same time, we love uh, manufacturing and fabrication and construction and politics and finance and all of those things that come together to make something that make people stop in the street and look up and smile. And it sounds so passionate the way that you're presenting it. Uh, yeah, to be an architect, you have to have passion every day because it's a tough, it's a tough business, but it's incredibly rewarding. These buildings echo the glamour of New York City's rental buildings of the 30s, a glamour that has long faded. How do these two buildings, the American Copper buildings, going to, what are they going to reintroduce into New York City rental living. They wanted something that was um, spectacular on the skyline, that had generous apartments, that had, uh, had beautiful custom kitchens and custom baths, and, and then was highlighted by 60,000 feet of amenity space for all of the residents uh, in the building. The American Copper Buildings have made a record recently in rental. What is it? Yes, the, the building is renting for some of the highest numbers of any rental in the city. And um, uh, while the building is 80% um, market rate, it's also 20% affordable units. And so we feel incredibly proud that we can make an equitable building that many different people can live in, um, but it is also doing incredibly well in the marketplace that people are really responding uh, to the level of finishes and the glamour and the views uh, that the building provides. And, and I love the glamour of the copper and it makes me think about the Seagram building, uh, which really requires a lot of polishing and upkeeping. Instead, you propose to accept the changes. Is this a new why? Why? That's always been an ethos of our work at SHOP. What we love to do is take traditional building materials, whether it's, uh, whether it's copper or bronze or terracotta or um, other kinds of metals and bricks and think about them uh, fabricated and designed in a very contemporary way. But with these beautiful materials, we always think it's important not to put a pristine finish on them. What actually makes them beautiful is the way that they age and patina gracefully over time. So how are they going to look 100 years from now? 100 years green? from now. Are they going to they be will green? Be, they will be Statue of Liberty green mm -hmm. when they are done, and which we think is a fantastic thing. But uh, it absolutely gives me a reason to live because I really want to see oh, them turn absolutely. green eventually. Can you give us some insight into the politics of building such an ambitious project in New York City? Uh, building in New York City is incredibly difficult, as you could imagine. I mean, it's, a, it's, an, it's an island. Everyone wants to be here. Every inch counts. There's incredibly complex rules surrounding what you can build, how you can build, the financing behind it, the politics, the branding, the marketing, the art, the aura, um, and, and the technological issues. So these buildings were built right along the river. And so by putting a, a two-story underground garage, we, we had to build it in the river itself. And we were, we were pumping out a million and a half gallons a day out of the construction site. And so technologically, it was a, a very complex building. And, um, and then they started to go up and, and, and the first buildings, as you know, they go up on an angle. The first building went up about six or seven stories. And one day we got a phone call from the, from the fire department and uh, someone had called in that they thought the buildings were falling over. And I had to race to the site and we showed them the drawings and they couldn't believe that the building was built at an angle. And then, and then they said, who was the crazy architect that came up with that? So I, 
I snuck away from the site. Well, not crazy to me because now when I drive down FDR and I look at these buildings, it really fills my soul. Well, thank and thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for tuning in. Until next time, remember, feed your taste. This episode is supported by Rego, a worldwide leader in the sale of fine design at auction. Mm -hmm.